G'day, I'm Ian Swain, the owner of Swain Destinations, where we customise travel experiences to Australia, New Zealand, South Pacific Islands, Africa, Asia and India. And welcome to another episode of G'day with Ian Swain. Today we're heading to Zambia and Madagascar in Southern Africa to speak with the owner of Time and Tide, Africa. Terry DeLay, Time and Tide's founder and chairman, through his background in finance, entered the tourism industry as one of the five original investors in North Ireland and the Seychelles. His passion for travel and boyhood dream to preserve a place in the bush and a place on the beach led to the creation of Time and Tide as a leading luxury safari company in Zambia and Madagascar. Time and Tide is truly a luxury brand that stands for long-term responsibility to do good and to preserve some of the world's most beautiful places. I had plans to visit the four properties earlier this year, but obviously couldn't. So here's the next best way to enjoy it. So welcome, Terry. Well, thank you, Ian. And uh, I'm sorry you couldn't visit. So as you say, maybe this is a, another way to, to get there. It is, yeah, it'll, it'll whet my appetite. And as soon as um, we, um, we can travel again, we'll be down there. Terry, of all the destinations in Southern Africa, what drew you to invest and preserve parts of Zambia and Madagascar? Yeah, I think this somewhere goes back in my, my history. Uh, we, as in my sort of professional life, uh, we were the first institutional shareholders in wilderness safaris uh, going into the late 90s. And uh, through that, uh, we, you know, we, we were showcasing this uh, natural beauty of the, the, the savannah parts of um, Africa that were close to Southern Africa, Botswana, and so on. And um, I, um, uh, given that we were private equity investors, we ended up selling out of these things and uh, we kept a reasonable contact. I would always talk to everybody that I knew in these, uh, in these industries and say to me, you know, tell me your favorite place and I would try and travel. And in my mid forties, uh, I found a break in my work life that uh, kind of got me to say, well, here's my chance. Let me, let me go and do this. So I learned to fly. Um, and uh, a helicopter principally and I went like nuts for it and I still I still continue flying and I've flew the rivers and the beaches and the coastlines and and <clears throat> by the time I followed the big rivers I fell in love with Zambia and in the lower Zambezi area of Zambia it's a truly a little it's an oyster it's a romantic gem of a, of a place you've got national parks on either side and I, I was quite taken taken by the lower Zambezi um, and it's a place where the big animals are, you know, big crocs, big elephants, big. And, you know, I, what I really truly enjoyed about it was you just had to be there. You didn't have to kind of go on, you know, uh, so you didn't need to get into a vehicle or anything like that. So I, I'd got, uh, I'd fallen in love with Zambia and said, all right, I'll find a little place for a family house in Zambia. And as, as I got to know Zambia more and more, we saw the opportunity of growing our safari business ex uh, and safari experiences throughout Zambia, which and it's truly a, a special place. So we are located today um, in, the, in, the, in the west, which is in the Lua Plain, which is quite spectacular, um, at the, in the lower Zambezi, which also, each place has a special feeling for me and is different. And in the South Luangwa, which is, it was the home of a Norman Carr. Um, and Norman Carr was a pioneer in conservation and related things and uh, he had passed on and there was a family who had bought his business and we we uh, we were then successor owners to, to that and continued with the with the um, adventure uh, that, that he had started. Um, Madagascar was a little bit of a different story. Um, I had, uh, we, uh, you mentioned earlier that we had had an interest in in uh, the, the North Island, uh, North Island uh, project. And, and it was you know, very close to my heart. And uh, through, through the years of its development um, and knowing, and my family are from Mauritius. And so I'm in kind of, I, I learned the, the, the bush from my childhood experiences because I grew, uh, was born and grew up in South Africa. But I had this family heritage which understood the, the Indian Ocean. So I was looking for something quite special uh, then North Island was that that exhaust, um, but then you know there were a number of shareholders. We decided to sell it. So when we came to Madagascar, where we were algae farming, we were running a business of algae farming in this area. I kind of discovered this just in, immense beauty and diversity that uh, was worthy of an encore as a follow-on from 
from what was North Island. So the best of our experiences and the best of our talents were put into what is today Miyavana. And uh, it's truly exceptional, I, 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 I must admit, because every time I go there, I say, oh, is this, is this what we did? No, that's great. And you've, it just seems your vision is very focused and it seems to expand into pioneering destinations. So why is this and can you share where's next? The pioneering part, sometimes from a business point of view, I think that's not so you know, smart because tourism product, the way we show luxury is a low density, consequently a little bit of a higher price. Um, uh, but the privacy of being in these beautiful places is, is quite exceptional. Um, I think that, uh, and these products were chosen by, you know, sort of the natural extension to our, our, our passions to, uh, and, and, uh, and our travel experiences. And of course, there are many, many beautiful places in the world. So I, I, uh, I, I don't, uh, I try and see the best in, in each. So the pioneering part is, yes, unfortunately, a bit of what we've done. We've been first uh, in some of these places, but truly, are we first? You know, we are just showcasing what was there before us. And really, you know, shining it up. And to ask, uh, to answer the question of what's next, well, it's it's an interesting juncture because while this um, this uh, Corona COVID has been going on, and we we've uh, suffered is not the word because just the doors came down. You know, uh, borders are shut. We've got a lot of people employed, uh, and we had to deal with uh, to deal with these issues. So amongst uh, the things that we did is look to, you know, what you know, look, look to the horizon and. Be, a bit and said, you know, what else should we be doing? So we've been in, invited and participant and thought of quite a few new areas, but really to build around an adventure, um, an adventure, a luxury business, which, um, you know, which has got travel and wild places in it. So there are, there are a few on the, on the menu, but I, I can't say to you that there's, uh, there's one that uh, we could sell to you tomorrow. Well, that's great. The, um, um, in Zambia, you, you mentioned you've got the three camps in three different locations. Can you elaborate a little bit, a little bit more on what the draw for these locations were and what's unique about these locations where time and, yes. time and tide has the camps? Yes. So if you, let's go to, let's work from, if you're looking at the map from, from sort of right to left. So the South Luangwa Valley um, is a sand, it's a Kalahari Sands Valley. It's the Luangwa is probably 800 kilometers long, if not, I'm not so sure. And it's, it's nowhere is it damped. No, nowhere is the river being interrupted. It's in the, in the valley, uh, the South Luangwa Valley, which is essentially a, a break off from the Great Rift Valley system geologically. And it's got a great uh, 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 history, uh, paleoanthropologically, if that's the word. You, we find things there that show that there was human life there a long time ago. The river um, is uh, in this, that runs through the Sand River, so it meanders quite nicely. And um, it's a place where you've got big plains. So the, the river is full of hippos, concentrated hippos, consequently uh, crocodiles. You've got great plains game. And uh, so it is really beautiful from birds to, it's, it's, it's no longer unfortunately got any rhinos. I think the 70s, um, 70s they put paid to that uh, or by the 70s it was pretty much the end we found some old movies by the way of norman carr where there's there are rhinos kind of running around and in fact on the site of the chinzombo camp in the south luangwa that was so the rhino anti-poaching center going back those years but they didn't win that battle but the, the ultimately it is a great natural phenomenon great game beautiful it's it's really completely stunning and of the of the, the people that were influencing me and in saying, you know, uh, when I was asking them, where are the great places, uh, and these were the kind of spiritual founders of the wilderness safaris business, I said, where are the great places, you know, wildlife places, they would talk about the South Luang. And so that was, that was an extension to something that we started um, um, at the Lower Zambezi. But it is truly beautiful. And um, uh, I am, um, every time I go there, I just, uh, I revel in it. I'm, it's, it's kind of wild Africa and, um, and close by are all, you know, you, I know that there are no sort of helis flying around there, but um, as you go north, there's what is called the Muchenga Mountains and above there, there are, it, the landscape is just quite, just quite spectacular. 
that's the from on the right. In the middle, the southern part, south of the river, okay, is the, the 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 Zambezi, and the Zambezi is the fourth largest uh, river in Africa, and uh, it is it's got its origins in the north western part of uh, of Zambia, right in the corner. And if you look at the map, there are funny lines drawn, um, but it does a little loop, and then. They are plains. They they are known as the Barotsi plains, and they feed the the the, the rains. Uh, it's it, north of it is the is the Congo, and this water collects and comes down and uh, congregates, and then gets to it gets to the Victoria Falls, and then onward down to the Lower Zambezi, and it finishes out on the east coast of Africa in Mozambique. But the part that's really quite exceptional about the Lower Zambezi, as as I mentioned earlier, is on either side of the river in that about 200 kilometer stretch, there are national parks. And um, so consequently, you know, you've got these just incredible vistas, lots of water, and um, uh, and, and it's uh, it's just, a, it's, to, to me, it's really stunning. And what we try and do is twin, often, um, the Lower Zambezi with uh, the South Luanga, which they're, they're different. Um, this is a giant flowing river all year round, and it's um, it's majestic. When we go to the to the to the west, so, so it's the left hand side of the page, um, the Lua Plain is a is an incredible is an incredible uh, destination. Or I'd I'd stopped there um, when we were flying. I, I wanted to fly to the source of the Zambezi, and when we got to this area, we Africa Parks, who are a great uh, conservation business, had begun the management of this park and. Um, I, I, for some reason, knew the ranger, and um, and we said, could we, could we come and stay? And he he showed us this place, and I was just stunned. <laughs> and he just, uh, and I, I was asking the ranger, D have you slept out in these plains? He said, no. So we we went that night, and we took our camping bags, and we we slept out, and it was it was kept we were kept awake by all kinds of things, but anyway. The point is, it is this great wonderland, and often people talk of it because there's a, a big wildebeest migration that takes place between the northern part of the park and the southern part. And we we have a camp, and we're the only camp in the southern part. And so this migration, you know, is essentially a food source. And uh, but when you go there, uh, people are often thinking, "Well, I want to see the migration or, or this thing." I, I was I've been knocked out by just observing what's going on. It's these grand vistas, and you can walk barefoot in the plains. There are no crocodiles or hippos because the water is not uh, deep enough there, and so it gets flooded. And you, the massive hyena uh, prize, the birds, the, the birds, uh, I just uh, just took my breath away. And so when people say, "Oh, it's a migration of wildebeest," I uh, I've often gone there, and sometimes the children, and I'm saying, "Well, tell me what you think." And it's it's like a it's like a Disneyland because everything you can see everything because it's open. So it's a time, distance, speed, predator, uh, you know, target, action. And so I, I've, I've been completely taken by that. So it's again now a third top, a third type of experience in the Zambian equation. Your enthusiasm is infectious, there, um, Terry. It's it's wonderful to hear you speak about it like this, and it makes me feel I should be there right now. The access, when the first time I went to Zambia, the access between different parks or different areas and different national parks in Zambia was always a challenge, um, but that's become easier over the years. Can you explain how one accesses your different camps and what's involved in the benefits of combining the camps? You touched on it just before, but would you put all three camps together or just two of them? Um, typically two, um, but the access, the access is an, Access is very important. So Lusaka is a, an international airport. Um, uh, these are now close to, to just close to the Lower Zambezi. It's a it's a half an hour or thirty minute flight from from Lusaka, and Lusaka is serviced by big airlines. Um, it can come directly from from outside centres and from regional centres. So you can get to Lusaka easily. And from Lusaka, you take a plane down to the Lower Zambezi. Uh, it's a light aircraft, and uh, it's a 10-minute drive to, to our camp. So that, that, that access is not complex. To go to the South Luangwa, which is in the east, 
the, the distance is a little further, you also take a, a little plane. And uh, there's also, uh, Mfui is in the South Luangwa, it's an international airport. So for private jet travelers, they can land there, no problem. And uh, the drive is just a little bit longer, and you, but you go through the village life of Mfui, which is really part of the wildlife too. You know, often people go, oh, do you want to see the animal? But actually you, you want to sit around a fire with some local people and eat and hear stories. And so you get a taste of that on the way through you want. Um, and then um, uh, the Lua plane, uh, we've, we've uh, put in a helicopter for the last leg there, but there are similarly from the center plane and then um, the heli ride, the heli ride in Lua plane is just a knockout. And, and the reason I say that is that I've done it many times and what could be a three and a half hour drive is a 15 minute uh, uh, flight uh, that makes you Get get where you are, you know. So, so access is not it's access is not difficult. Sometimes it's a bit expensive in the sense that you know you have to take these flights, but that will that will will come down, you know. And we're we're helpful in trying to let's call it uh, subsidize is not the word, but yeah, we you know we understand that's part of the part of the package. Well, yeah, people expect that to get to the remote areas. You've got to take take a it's a more difficult to get to, and I think the average traveler or the discerning traveler understands that quite well. You mentioned, you touched on this before about the, um, within your collection, you've got barefoot luxury to modern, more modern luxury, um, which also allows you to make combinations, you've, as you've just said. But can you also talk about the difference in the actual camps themselves, the, the tents and the, the style of the lodges? So um, what is also very characteristic of what I consider Zambian travel experience or bush experience is that you you're close to the ground you, so one of the the great feelings that you can have in discovering any place in the world is to be on foot um so I w and, and the zambian you need to be on the ground so you know, so the hippos can be you know kind of sliding past the tent you can hear them munching you can you're not away from them that you're in it um and so in our let's call it our more uh, our, our bush camps and uh um, uh, adventure camps. Well, we don't call them that, but essentially, uh, when you're not in the shishi spot, um, you, you, you are in camps that are very well uh, organized and comfortable. Uh, but the, the characteristic philosophically is be close to the ground, be, uh, don't have hard walls that you know take you away from the sounds and so on. So the, uh, and so the comfort I think is great, and the, the what's been the philosophy for us is what you touch and feel must be first class. So when you get into your bed, you say, ah, I'm, I'm going to sleep well. And I've got all the comforts and the safety that I need. And, um, and food equally, uh, if people have got needs and uh, we, we try and bring local cuisine as much as occidental cuisine. So it, they, you know, people feel comfortable. And uh, yeah, I, I think that sitting around the fire, um, having a drink, uh, eating communally, often in these camps when they're small, uh, you, you meet an interesting people and uh, they share their lives. In the, in the high in luxury is got the same philosophy, but it's got much more architectural design. Maybe in me is that I've admired the style queens of, you know, architectural design and Silvio Rech and uh, Leslie Carstens who designed North Island. Well, we, we, they've become close friends and have been They've been, you know, designing all of our higher end stuff, and uh, I think they're they're super talented. And so, that that part of it doesn't take away from being in in the nature. But yes, it is it is higher end, and uh, it's truly beautiful. So you've got, you know, pools, and and it's not something that you would you wouldn't build it for yourself. If I can put it that as a as a qualification, it's it's a little bit of a dream. It's a little bit out there. Um, and so you 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 know you get transported. Well, you know, our clients want to have something different. That's the whole idea of coming to Africa or coming to different destinations around the world is to experience something different and something you don't have at home. And it's going to become more more obvious now that people are going to want that more and more often. But you're very you're 100 accurate on those talks around the the fire pit after game drive at night time and talking to your fellow travellers from around the world. Uh, you, you do share stories and you share your life and you feel like you're part of family as soon as you arrive at one of the camps. 
Um, I read also about the sleep out safaris you offer, and you mentioned that your first encounter with the, uh, the planes was a sleep out. You offer sleep outs now. Which camps is this available from? And is it only available in certain times of the year? And what would you say to clients who are nervous about the sleep out? What reassurances are there of their safety? So uh, I think part of the sleep out is maybe you have a whiskey uh, more than you should and uh, you sleep well uh, and you will hear, you know, animals waking you up. And I think it's part of the adventure personally. The, what we've done with the sleep outs is that when you're on the ground, uh, we, we will have, uh, we will have uh, light, fire, and there's a, uh, there's a sentry with the, your guys stay up all night. So often we sleep in the riverbed in the, in the Louis Riverbed in the South of Luangwa. And it's, it is, uh, it's mind changing. Um, a, a lot of people, um, yeah, they, they, they're not sure what they're getting into, but when they finished it all, they said, Oof, that was fantastic. So if they feel uncomfortable, we, they can, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm truly uncomfortable and saying, look, I, I'm going to get freaked out here. Um, we will take, take them to a camp. We'll, you know, we've, got, we've got all the support vehicles around. And we'll do that, or we'll make sure that they sit around the fire and drink whiskey all night, you know, with, with depending what they want to do. So um, I think that in the other areas, what we've come to use now is um, these suspended tents that they're off the ground. And um, you, um, you, you, you it's, it's not the same, it's not the same dimension of uh, you're not on the ground. You don't think something is going to come into your, your, you know, your foot or anything like that. So I, I'm, I'm exaggerating. I, I think that, um, but there are, and in the Lua Plain, uh, we, we use them. So it's essentially uh, four or five foot off the ground. It's one of these kind of stretched tents. I think there are pictures about them in our brochures. And, um, but yes, I, I think that's really, it's really nice to do it. Um, but you don't have to, you know. Um, it reminds me of the, the tree houses they have in the, uh, in Southern Africa now in some of the camps. And um they become very popular. You just got to get over the the initial uh, fear factor, and once you do, you have an incredible experience. But also, it's quite romantic for honeymooners to go out there and be alone in the in, yes. the, in the wilderness like that. Let's just yes. talk about the game viewing, and we have touched on it, or you've touched on it in the last several minutes, uh, particularly on the plains, which uh, which you mentioned the wildebeest. It's supposedly the second largest wildebeest migration, um, obviously past the Great Migration in Kenya, Tanzania. Uh, but also, what are the other animals that you're going to see while you're game viewing in Zambia? Come uh, a bit shot out. I think there, there are stories about how and why. There is the Frankfurt Zoo has got a reintroduction program in uh, the North Uangwa National Park. And um, so I think there will be uh, regular kind of uh, onward reintroductions. But... You know, that, that's the one that's, uh, but otherwise every, everything else. And you, then you're also going to see, you're going to see quantities that are different um, uh, because there's a scale that, that, that is different. It's not, it's not like the Sabi Sands, which is, uh, you know, the animals, you can see them all, but not, not in the same numbers, but every place has got its, its story. So I think that from the mammal count, um, you know, from the Kafui National Park, it has more mammals than any other, you know, any other national park, I think in Africa. Um, so I, what, what is key for me is that often, and I think, I think it's normal, people get inducted, it's like, a, you have, it's like a tick box. I wanna see the big five. And so the big five means, that, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna see it. Well, we can, we can, in some places, you can see the big five before lunch, you know, and it's become that way organized. Um, the Zambian, the Zambian way is uh, very, the guides are first class. I mean, I, I have uh, the Zambians that have had, they're very well trained. They've got a great manner of showing and talking and gentle. And it's the one, it's the other thing that I must say about Zambia. These are beautiful people with lots of, of life to, lessons to, to teach, to teach you, you know, when you come out of a city. So the animals, um, it's to just understand the context for me, that with the context you're in and saying, okay, well, if I just stop here, what's gonna, what's happening around me? Rather than being on the hunt or gonna try and see, you know, tick, uh, tick things off. So I think you'll see pretty much everything, but if there's an expectation 
that you're going to get the big five in the lure plane. No, we can't do that. Um, if it is that, um, and now I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm over 60, uh, I kind of, I, I don't think I'd be different if I was 20 and I wanted to see, I, I want to see the big five, but to see something like the lure plane or the lower Zambezi, or the, I, I, I think that those things are unique. They're, and and the, the fact that there are animals there that have been there for a long time, I, I think that's a, the, the big way. But I, I don't think we, barring the rhinos, the, the rhinos uh, issue, um, I, you know, you, you see everything. And of course, there are always variations. So you know, the, the zebras have got a different kind of stripe because they're of that type. That the, the thorny craft giraffe is a little bit different. And so it's unique. Well, let's just talk about Madagascar at the moment because you've got a property there, Time and Tide Miyavana, which absolutely looks stunning. Um, and I, as you know, I haven't personally been there. I was meant to go there earlier this year, but can you tell us why that is such a special place to you and why you built the lodge the way you did? I mentioned earlier that, uh, that we were invested in a uh, algae farming business and um, and uh, the man who had kind of got uh, got this going um, was a cave explorer, and of course Madagascar is uh, is it's, it's huge. And uh, anyway, so he was living on the northeastern coast, and he was traveling, and he saw this archipelago of islands, and uh, he was scuba diving there, and he was noticing that this thing was you know pretty much left alone, and he thought, well, he needs to. To protect it so because it'll get like many things you know when it's free there's no cost so people chop the trees down you know they pummel it to death and then when it's finished they leave um so he was saying look I, I need to find a way of protecting this so he he started this algae farming business so algae farming to make uh, so it's seaweed that grows very fast because multiplies its weight in a month by about five times and then it gets dried and then processed and sent to the people that work with biopolymers and, and so on, which, you know, goes into your food, into uh, all kinds of, you know, kind of products. Anyway, so he was doing this and we had invested in this business and we were starting to get worried. Well, when I got there and we were starting to see there was all kinds of issues with the, the algae farm. They were starting to, we were starting to notice parasites, not parasites in a bad way. It's just that we're, they're inhibiting the natural propagation of the, the algae. And so it was retarding it. And so the yields were starting to drop. The independent farmers were not getting, you know, the, 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 the money that would, and they started predating on the place, you know, chopping the trees down, digging stuff out of the forest. And I was, I was getting quite concerned about this. And I said, look, you know, we, we, need, to, we need to protect this island. And so um, we, we said, okay, well, how do we do this? And uh, we said, look, if we can secure some land rights that give us some security of being able to invest in here, We'll do that. So we went about that and we turned all of these algae farmers into construction workers and we built this, this place. Um, and it was just an incredible journey because it is, was completely beautiful. So you had of the sort of nine islands in the archipelago, there's one which is you know, a significant uh, n uh, nesting site for terns in the southwestern Indian Ocean. So you get from May to kind of July, you get 90,000, just, they just come. And um, we were seeing turtles, a lot, a lot of turtles uh, laying their eggs. And we were seeing, listen, we better, do, we better take care of this stuff. So we set about a ecological restoration. So we took out all the, what we considered the base of trees. And we started this, this process. Um, and we had a nursery, it was a giant nursery. Um, and the, the, the same architect team and the same kind of construction well, team that we had done these other projects with uh, came, to, came uh, to join us. And we asked all of our friends to say, do you see the beauty in this uh, the way we do? Um, and we kind of got a resounding yes. And what is special about it is that it's, it's got this huge diversity of, let's call it, uh, uh, land-based diversity and ocean-based diversity. So we've got from very deep water to shallow waters to islands to mangroves to so the diversity of this place was special but what what it particularly attracted me was its beaches on the island were as good 
as anything I'd seen in all of my travels. Uh, if not, I, I would rate, I'm going to say, you've got to be careful on, the, on this because there are lots of very good things in the world and I don't want to say something's best. But it is in that class where you take a walk on that beach, it, you know, you'll walk for kilometers and it'll change your mind and you'll see the, the, these azure waters and you'll see the, 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 the fish action. You're, so I, I, was, I was saying, well, does this thing pass if you just sat on the beach? Was it good enough? And it passed that test and it passed, so all, let's call it all the normal human hedonist tests. You know, could you sit and have a nice drink at sunset and just chill? So it met that test, but it then had this diversity of land base and all, all the other activities uh, that made it really super special. I think it's fantastic that your, your vision or your views or your focus on conservation grew a resort out of that and by saving the algae farm and et cetera. So it's really great to do that. Um, and I actually just last night on the television watched a documentary on Madagascar, which showed those beautiful caves and they're some of the largest underwater caves in the world, if not the world. Uh, and they had diving down there. So it could have been your friend for taking pictures of it. But I want to lead into conservation because it goes hand in hand with all African safaris and explain some of the work you're doing with African parks. You use touched on it before with the rebuilding of the lion population. And also a couple of times you've mentioned Norman Carr. I know how important he was, but perhaps in your words, you could explain what he brought to the, to the world or what he, what he, how he helped save the world for us. Yeah. So Norman, Norman's history, he was the ranger in, uh, let's call it, a, uh, I suppose in the fifties, in an Eastern part of the, uh, sorry, the Western part of the country. And he, he um, was made the warden of what was a, like a new park, in, which is in the South Luangwa area. And he, he had a view that the communities needed to see value. They needed to see value in preserving, in preserving this. And the engagement of the communities and the give back to the communities and va giving value to their natural, the natural heritage was key to this. And, so I think what Norman was particularly good at was he was a good promoter of this. He was a great writer. I mean, I've read some of his books and I'm not a great writer, but I, it, it's just, it's just his really beautiful books that he writes. And he had a story, you know, he, he brought up these two lions and then they had come from the Kafui area and he had reared them and they'd followed him. And so that there was a romantic part of that and he, he you know, put them back in the bush and uh, um, and today, that um, the, the genes that were from those lions are evident in the lion populations in the South Luangwa. But Norman, Norman particularly became well known, or as the first to run the first walking safaris. And so, it's ingrained in, our, in the DNA of of that business to to do to do walks, because it's the best way to see things. So we have in South Luangwa, we have four parks in the national park, and you can walk from one to the other, and it's really great. And it's a, it's not a strenuous walk. Um, and um, you, you, but when you're, when you're on foot and there's an elephant and or on a, you size things up a little differently. And so I think there is, there's something really respectful about appreciating the little things. You, you're not trying to challenge an elephant or in, in, their, in their land. So it's a very, it's a very special, it's called a culture and all of the guides that uh, that we have there have this have been in the history trained on and some of them are still you know still can tell you stories about Norman. So Norman had a big role. He also, I was talking to um, another well-known safari man, and he said no. In the, a long time ago, he'd asked Norman to come and set something up like that for them in Kenya, but it 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 didn't it didn't take root. Um, so I, I think that there's a great history in. Um, in, in uh, Norman's uh, commitment, or there's a, the great stories in Norman's commitment to conservation and tourism. And of course, tourism, and it goes back to this conservation thing. And I think this deals with, um, this deals with the natural world at large. If we don't give value to this natural world that we, we are endowed with, uh, it, it'll get eaten. It, it, it's got to be, we have to give value to these things so that we protect them. And I think that the great conservation organizations of the world, um, uh, and some, of, some I, I was really taken by 
um, speech that I'd heard in uh, in Uganda uh, in Rwanda by the, the head of the Conservation International um, Business, and he he articulated this is very very important. And so I think that how do you how do you give things value? And 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 so you go into the the business economics of nature, and uh, one of the most important things to me is people people live in these very remote places and they live off the land and how do they give values they've got to monetize this in the in the kind of modern world uh, you know because you need money i mean it's like the universal language so so uh, I, what we think is really good is that tourism has got massive multipliers and it, it, it's uh, it's the one that gives more jobs and long term will be the, the the business that um, gives this value that i talk about and I, so I'm a believer in it. And I think that many countries all over the world have understood what tourism has done to their economies. And I think these African, or for that matter, it's just limited to Africa. These wild places need to be protected because they'll otherwise get eaten would be the wrong word. Um, but yeah, they'll get degraded. Yeah, no, and it's wonderful that yourself and other lodge owners and, and safari outfitters are doing the right thing and investing back in. And you're right, tourism amounts globally for one in 10 jobs in the world. Uh, and it's actually more in Africa. It's more like one in every six jobs are, are related to tourism. So it's a way of giving back and the conservation comes out of that. You mentioned the walking safaris and the first time Linda and I went to um, Africa, we went to Zimbabwe and did a walking safari and came across uh, an elephant, a herd of elephants and they gave us a little fake charge, which was, interesting and um, adrenaline rising very quickly because that, that was our first experience. But since then, we've done several walks in different places. I'd like to talk about over the last several months, um, Africa is you know, such a big community and made up of, of hundreds of different sort of little communities around there of which your, your lodges and your camps are communities. I'm hearing wonderful stories of how the communities have banded together during the time of the pandemic. And I wonder if you could share one, one story you've got of, of one of your communities uh, banding together and doing something good. Wow. I'm not going to do this justice, but what I can tell you is that in this, uh, in this shock that we endured, and so in so if we just talk about Zambia and, well, I suppose Madagascar too. So in the middle of March, we kind of thought hard about this and said, we're not, we're, we're not going to see a customer, we're not, not for six months. And uh, we don't think we're going to see a customer for the rest of the year. What are we going to do here? Um, and so we, you know, we talked to all of our seniors and, um, and we, we, we came to this conclusion. It was quite harsh. And so we explained for those people who were working with us and were housed and fed, uh, uh, yeah, they could take salary cuts. But there was deep, it was deep chopping. But there are others who needed to go home, and um, and and so you you had a you had this kind of shock uh, absorbing <laughs> making it the people. It's all the people, shareholders, suppliers, whatever. Everybody's kind of you know bearing a bit of the load. And what has been remarkable is the attitude with which uh, people have understood this problem and, and how they've, as you say, how they've helped each other. So what, what is a firm we do, um, and this was, this is important for you to know, is that in and around our businesses, we had always had needs from the communities for education, healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. And some years ago, we set up a foundation called the Time and Tide Foundation, which would assist so we'd set up this foundation and uh, we would, uh, regardless of, um, we'd take a percentage of, of the revenues and we'd put it in there. And throughout this period, we have, con we have not slowed down our foundation efforts, which are around schooling, uh, you know, education for girls, important part of it. And you can find it out on the, on the foundation. But we, you know, we spend $600,000 a year on that stuff and we continue to do that. And, uh, and so, you know, donors, and so it was organized. So we saw what the communities were needing. And, um, and then our staff were helpful. And we made, obviously, uh, contributions we could to create alternative industries and, and help. But it's been really tough. <laughs> There's no other way of, 
putting it for shareholders downwards, but I, I, you know, we're there. So I, um, we, we, uh, you know, we'll get, we'll get through this. Well, you're open, you're open again now. The borders are open, and you're accepting um, guests from all around the world. And uh, we've actually got a special where we combine your camps with um, a visit to Livingston as well in the south part of Zambia. So you get the Victoria Falls aspect as well. So you can check out our website for that. But um, Terry, I'd just like to thank you for spending so much time with me this morning and talking about your, uh, your vision, your focus, your passion, obviously. And, and I said, it, it's infectious how your enthusiasm comes across. And I just really can't wait to get down there and, and visit the camps and, and have a gin and tonic or a whiskey or maybe do the sleep out uh, with, you, um, with you again. Yes. I I, and Ian, I, I think that uh, for us, um, what, what I, I think is particularly special is that when you get there, you can let go, and we'll show you, you know, uh, we'll show you, we'll show you this part of the world, and uh, and and make it understood where you are in the world and why it's relevant and so on. And of course, w one of the most important parts of of travel is this kind of uh, this, these feelings that you get, and I, I do think that we are in that in that business of, um, let's call it luxury, but luxury in a grounded sense, you know, see these communities, see these places, be richer for it and uh, return rested. Now that's exactly what we're looking for. So I can't wait. Uh, you whet my appetite even more and um, we'll see you soon. Thank you.